All right, thank you so much for joining us today for our uh, webinar. Our speaker today will be Ben Miller. Uh, ben has been working on the development of in situ techniques since 2010 when he began a master's degree project to illuminate transmission electron microscopy samples with it with broadband light inside an FEI Tech 9 S20 TEM. This created an in situ environment mimicking solar radiation for photocatalysis research. Ben's PhD was done in the group of Dr. Peter Crozier at Arizona State University, and his work focused on the development of operando environmental TEM to simultaneously observe catalyst nanostructures and measure catalytic activity inside the TEM. In 2016, Ben joined GATAN as an in situ application specialist. And in this role, Ben is pioneering the development of new and better in situ workflows and techniques. Ben does this by designing experiments, collecting TEM data, demonstrating the capabilities of Catan's in situ products, and presenting at workshops and conferences around the world. Ben also provides applications training and support to researchers, helping to specify the capabilities of future in situ TEM equipment and software. I'll turn it over to, to Ben to present the information today. And if you have any questions, please use the chat box to uh, let those be known to us. And at the end of Ben's presentation, we'll go through some questions. Ben. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, and thank you to all of you who are tuning in live uh, to this webinar today. I'm excited to be talking about uh, both institute yields and men's space heating uh, in the TEM. Uh, I'm going to start today by talking about the importance of in situ experiments. And I think uh, for many of you, uh, you already understand uh, the value of doing in situ experiments in the TEM. Uh, but I have an example here, uh, which I think illustrates very nicely uh, the, the true value of doing in situ experiments in the microscope. Uh, up in the top left or the top right corner of this video here, you can see uh, this catalyst particle that is undergoing rather dramatic changes uh, inside the microscope. Uh, in, in this video, the sample is being heated uh, to 730 degrees in a, a gas environment. And uh, the, this particle in the top right corner is uh, transforming from an oxide to a metal uh, and back again, and it's doing this in a, a cyclical way. Uh, and I, I just want to point out here that if you were doing a, a traditional TEM experiment where you were looking at the uh, this catalyst material before and after the reaction, uh, you you might look at these two particles uh, before and after and and uh, do some detailed analysis, uh, look at the morphology, the, the surface facets, uh, the, the change in size, um, and all of that detailed analysis would really completely miss what's going on uh, during the reaction. And it's what's happening during uh, some dynamic event that is often uh, what we're most interested in. Uh, and so doing in situ experiments is, is really essential uh, to capture these dynamics as they occur. Uh, so today I'm going to have three major topics uh, that I'll be covering. First is in situ eel. Uh, and I'll give uh, some examples of published data as well as uh, some uh, data that I've acquired recently uh, doing EELS videos in the TEM. Uh, then I'll talk a bit about MEMS-based heating and how that works. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'll talk about temperature measurement and calibration of the MEMS-based heating holders, and, and particularly the Zen Solutions heating holder uh, and hopefully answer the question, how accurate is the temperature of your sample? Uh, so first, uh, in situ electron energy loss spectroscopy. Uh, EELS is, is a technique uh, where we are looking at the uh, electrons that have passed directly through the sample uh, and, and go into the EELS spectrometer. 
And you can see here on the right of this slide uh, a schematic diagram of an eel spectrum. Uh, and what I wanted to point out here is that there is a lot uh, of information contained in this spectrum. It's, it's a complicated spectrum. Uh, there's a lot of different types of information uh, here. And uh, I don't I, I don't want to go over each of these uh, in detail right now. Uh, if you want more information about this, you can go to, to this website here, eels.info, uh, where there's uh, more about all of these. Uh, but I, I just wanted to point out which of these types of information that you could obtain using eels are useful for in situ experiments. And in fact, that would be all of them. Uh, every one of these types of information can change uh, during the course of an in situ experiment as you're applying some stimulus to the sample. Uh, and so all of these types of information uh, can be useful during an in situ experiment. Specifically today, uh, in the presentation that I'm giving here, I'm going to show examples of four of these types of information. Uh, so I'll, I'll show an example where uh, yields is used to measure the specimen thickness, uh, specifically the gas thickness. Uh, I'll show examples uh, of measuring the electron density, which gives you an idea of the, the temperature of the sample. I'll talk about, uh, I'll show an example of an interband transition and also of an oxidation state change uh, all uh, within this uh, the next few slides here. Uh, so first I'll show some published results and uh, from these four publications. Starting with this book chapter, uh, this is a, a book chapter that uh, was written by myself and Peter Crozier. Uh, my PhD professor just uh, a couple of years ago, and it's included in, in the excellent book by Thomas Hansen and Jacob Wagner. Uh, and I, again, don't have time today to go over each of these examples in detail, uh, but I do want to point out uh, that over here on the right, we have an example uh, of a spectrum uh, obtained from the low loss region. Uh, here is information about the composition of the sample in the core loss region of the spectrum. Here is another example uh, from the core loss region, this time in STEM mode. Uh, here in the center is an example of using eels to measure uh, the temperature uh, and, and gas pressure inside a, a gas cell. And here is an example in the top left of using uh, the low loss region of the spectrum to measure the gas composition. Uh, and so there are a number of different ways that yields can be used uh, for in situ experiments, both to, to measure uh, the material itself as well as to measure the conditions. Uh, so here is an example published more recently, published uh, since that book chapter uh, from Brookhaven National Lab. And in this case, they were looking at the oxygen K edge uh, as a function of temperature in a variety of different environments uh, in an environmental TEM. And so they were looking at the oxygen loss from a nickel cobalt aluminum battery electrode. Uh, and they could see from this uh, pre-peak on the oxygen edge, uh, by, by looking at subtle changes in uh, the intensity of that pre-peak, they could uh, see the, uh, the change in oxygen content uh, of this battery electrode under these various environmental conditions. Uh, here's another example from uh, data that was acquired at Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, in this case, they're looking at nanoparticle oxidation. Uh, and this is a, a bimetallic cobalt nickel nanoparticle. Uh, and you can see here clearly in the yield spectra, uh, early in the oxidation process, uh, there's the shell, uh, an oxide shell that's forming. Uh, 
uh, on this nanoparticle. And then later, uh, looking at this other particle, you can see uh, that clearly the, uh, the oxidation has proceeded and the entire particle uh, has been oxidized here. Uh, and in fact, there are even uh, small voids in this particle, uh, and a lot more detail uh, about that is given in this publication. Uh, here's the, the final example, the final, final published example I want to show today. Uh, this is actually from my own PhD work uh, with Peter Crozier. Uh, and in this case, we're using eels not to measure the sample, uh, but to measure the composition of the gas uh, in the microscope in an environmental TEM. And in this case, we're actually converting CO into CO2 using the catalyst sample in the microscope. And so we could actually, by measuring the gas composition, we could quantify the uh, activity of this catalyst in the microscope while we were observing the structure uh, in the TEM. And uh, so again, this is an example where we're using yields not to measure the sample, but to measure uh, the conditions surrounding the sample, and in this case, the catalytic activity. So the next uh, few slides I want to show, I want to talk about uh, what I call eels videos, uh, where we're able to continuously acquire eel spectra over time. And uh, by doing this during some in-situ experiment, uh, we can observe changes in material uh, over time. And I, I'm talking about these uh, continuous uh, eels acquisitions, uh, and there are a, a number of challenges uh, that arise when you try to continuously acquire eels data. Uh, so I, I want to briefly talk about several of those. Uh, one is drift during in-situ stimulus. Um, often, especially with older uh, heating holders, you would see significant drift uh, in the, the sample uh, as you heat to, to higher temperatures. And this makes it difficult to acquire any data continuously, uh, but especially yield data where you may not uh, see the sample, you may not actually observe the drift. Uh, so it's impossible to, to then compensate or, or move the stage uh, to keep the sample in the field of view. Uh, but today, uh, this is being addressed to, to some extent by the introduction of MEMS-based heating holders. Uh, so for example, the, the Den Solutions wildfire holder significantly minimizes uh, the drift inside the microscope, and this really enables uh, continuous skills acquisition uh, to, to be performed uh, in the TEM. Uh, uh, another challenge for continuously acquiring yields data is that we really want to limit the effect of the electron beam. And this is true for any TEM experiment, but especially true for in situ TEM experiments. Uh, where we want to see a change, and, and so uh, it's very important to distinguish changes uh, based on the, the in-situ stimuli that are applied versus changes due to the electron beam. And uh, so we want to limit the effect of the beam. And also, it's particularly a challenge for, for eels uh, that often we need a long exposure time uh, so for, for FTEM or for high energy loss edges, uh, often a, a long exposure time uh, or, or a very high uh, beam current are required to obtain good signal to noise. And so this is currently being addressed uh, by Gatan K2 camera in counting mode. Uh, and counting really enables uh, us to use much lower dose uh, during the eels acquisition uh, and really helps to address these uh, two challenges here. And I'll, I'll talk in a minute more about uh, the K2 counting and, and how that works. Uh, 
Uh, finally, it's, it's often a challenge to collect EELS data continuously because we often want to acquire some incompatible signal. Uh, so if you want to acquire a TEM video or, or diffraction patterns continuously uh, while you're applying some stimulus, you can't do that simultaneously uh, with the EELS collection. Uh, you can in STEM mode, of course, uh, but in TEM mode, that's uh, currently not possible. So how does counting uh, help uh, to uh, enable lower dose acquisition uh, for uh, yields? Uh, this is because the, the counting mode of the K2 camera eliminates several of the sources of noise uh, that are normally present in a, a more traditional CCD camera. Uh, so you can see here there are uh, four uh, different sources of noise in this equation. I'm not going to go into each of these in detail. Uh, if you want more information, I, I recommend uh, Edgerton's uh, classic book, as well as uh, the uh, eels.info website, which uh, is shown on the next uh, slide. But what I want to point out here is just that shot noise or, or Poisson noise is really the only source of noise that is still present uh, in the, the data when it's collected using the counting mode of the K2. And it really is the counting uh, mode of the K2 that enables this lower dose. Uh, it, it's not so much the direct detection of the camera. Uh, but the fact that we're actually counting individual electrons. And so I briefly want to uh, go over how that works. Uh, I don't have time to go over this in, in great detail, uh, but an electron hits the sensor at a particular location. But after that electron hits the sensor, there's spreading of, of the signal due to secondary electrons and, and other effects. Uh, the, the signal will spread over multiple pixels, typically. Uh, and so then charge is collected and, and read out uh, from each of these pixels. Uh, but what the K2 is able to do live during acquisition is to, to then localize, based on this distribution of charges, localize the electron to the, the particular pixel that that electron struck. Uh, and in fact, we can even go a bit further uh, and, and not only localize it to the individual pixel, but to the quadrant of the pixel uh, where that electron hit. And this allows us to really have improved uh, quantum efficiency uh, as, as well as uh, uh, much better signal to noise in the resulting yield spectra. So here's uh, the first uh, continuously acquired example that I'm going to show. This is an FTEM mode, uh, looking at the low loss region of the spectrum. Uh, this is acquired with the slit at about 5 EV, and you can see a, a very dramatic change here as I'm heating up to 1,200 degrees uh, inside the microscope using a dense solutions holder. Uh, and so this sample is, is a rather complex uh, molecular material, uh, and it, it undergoes a, a significant change, uh, as might be expected, as you heat this up to 1,200 degrees. And by doing uh, some spectrum imaging uh, prior to the FTEM experiment, we were able to find that uh, after heating up to 1,200 degrees, we observed uh, this peak at about 6 EV. Uh, and uh, we believe that this is uh, due to the, the production of a graphitic carbon uh, on the surface of, of this material. Uh, and so we wanted to see the, the distribution of this uh, live as we heated uh, the sample up to 1,200 degrees. And in this case, uh, we have a, a temporal resolution of 10 frames per second, uh, which for, for FTEM data is, uh, is quite nice. 
my next example is another FTEM uh, video, this time in the core loss region of the spectrum. And so uh, here we're looking at an iron oxide particle uh, and uh, again heating up to, to a very high temperature, 1100 degrees. Um, and we can see a, a clear morphology change here. Uh, and what I want to point out is that this uh, type of, of video uh, of the oxygen K edge in FTEM uh, would be very difficult, if, if not impossible, to obtain uh, without the, the counting uh, and, and the low dose capabilities of the, the new K2 uh, detector on the back of the GIF. Uh, because the, the signal here is, is extremely low out at such a high uh, energy loss in FTEM. The next couple of examples that I'm going to show are not FTEM videos, but a uh, series of eel spectra acquired over time. And before I show those examples, I just want to show uh, where, how do I do this uh, in uh, GMS? This is a, a question I'm often asked when I present this data. Uh, so I, I want to show uh, here in, in the interface, uh, in GMS3, we have this technique, uh, which is called a, a stem spectrum image technique. Uh, and in this technique, we have uh, the spectrum uh, image acquisition palette here. And you can see options for, for a traditional 2D array or a line scan, but also an option for a time series of spectra. And uh, so we can see here in, in the uh, control palette for that time series acquisition uh, that we can acquire EELS as a function of time, EDS, uh, cathodoluminescence, even uh, 40 stem uh, diffraction data. Uh, as a function of time uh, very easily uh, within the, the GMS interface. And there's even more uh, settings here that I don't have time to, to go over today. Uh, but uh, more detail about that is, is found in the GMS help. Uh, here's the, the first example that I want to show of uh, a continuously acquired set of eel spectra uh, and this is a, an iron uh, oxide sample. It's actually the same uh, sample that uh, we used before. Um, and uh, you can see that there's a very clear shift uh, in the iron L edge uh, of about 1.25 EV. And uh, so here's a bit more detail about that sample. This is what the sample looks like in STEM. Uh, and you can see it here uh, on the spectrometer uh, in the, the entrance aperture uh, is the circle here. So this is the region of the sample uh, from which we're acquiring these eel spectra. Uh, and um, the, the sample, it, it starts out as an iron oxide hydroxide. Uh, but converts to an iron oxide, uh, and that's what causes this uh, 1.25 EV shift in the iron L edge. And by uh, also acquiring the oxygen K edge, we can see that, in fact, this is a real shift um, and not just an artifact in the spectrum uh, because this oxygen uh, edge does not shift uh, at the same time. And uh, this is not dual eels. This is uh, all one spectrum, and I've, I've just split it. Uh, this is something that you can do now in, in GMS3 to split the single spectrum. Uh, so here's my final uh, example of a continuously acquired eels uh, data. Uh, this is in the, the low loss region of the spectrum. Um, and uh, you can see the, the change in the uh, plasmon uh, peak energy as I'm heating the sample up. Uh, there we are at 700 degrees, and it, it actually melts uh, above that temperature and now going back to uh, 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, and so we can see this, this very clear shift in the plasmon peak energy. And this can actually be used to measure the temperature 
uh, of the sample inside the microscope. Uh, and uh, as I briefly mentioned earlier, uh, and we'll come back to that uh, at the end of my talk, uh, but I just want to point out here uh, that I was able to continuously acquire these spectra and then actually fit the spectra uh, in GMS, uh, and it will, uh, based on, on the fit of one spectra, you can easily apply that to the entire spectrum image and get uh, the, the plasmon peak energy uh, and then plot that versus uh, temperature. And so we can see here uh, that there's a, a very clear shift in the plasmon peak energy as it increases up to around 700 degrees. Then we have melting and, and this very uh, dramatic uh, shift here. Um, but we can actually use this, again, to, to measure the temperature of the sample inside the microscope. So now I want to, to shift uh, to uh, MEMS-based heating folders. And I'll talk a bit about the, the technology behind these and, and specifically for the DEN solutions holder, uh, though I'll mention a, a couple of others. Um, but I also want to talk about how do we know the accuracy of the temperature uh, of the sample inside the microscope. Uh, so here I'm showing uh, three examples of different heating holder technologies. Uh, so we have on the left uh, the, the protochips type heating holder where uh, there's a, a ceramic membrane which is the heating element. Uh, then in the center we have the DEN solutions heating holder uh, where there's a metallic heating element that's fully encased within a ceramic uh, silicon nitride membrane. And then finally on the right, uh, the older uh, furnace style holders, uh, which allow you to heat uh, a much larger sample. And just to give a sense of, of scale here, uh, here are the, the DEN solutions and the protoships holders um, to scale with the, the Gatan furnace style holder. Uh, so you can see the, the much larger area that you're able to heat uh, using the older holders, uh, whereas the, the new uh, men's-based holders provide much better stability. So the, uh, the DEN Solutions heating holder uh, has this heating spiral, this metallic heating spiral. Uh, and you can see uh, that design here, uh, I think, uh, quite familiar as, as that is also their logo. Uh, but you can, you can see here in cross-section uh, the metallic heating element uh, here uh, that is fully encased in a, a silicon nitride uh, material. And then uh, thin regions here and here, which are the windows uh, that allow you to observe the sample uh, in the microscope. And here is, is an actual image of one of these chips uh, taken using an optical microscope where you can see these uh, windows and, and a sample present on the chip. And it's in the central windows uh, that you want to work uh, as you're using one of these DEN solutions holders. So the, this uh, metallic heating element and this uh, spiral design uh, is, uh, Nice because it has these four uh, contacts, uh, which allow you to do a, a four-point probe type uh, resistance measurement. Uh, and in fact, because this uh, heating element is a metal, uh, the resistance of a metal is directly proportional to temperature. And so the relationship between the resistance, which is being measured, and the temperature, which you want to know, is uh, just a, a simple linear relationship. And this makes calibration of the, the holder uh, quite easy. So how does DEN solutions calibrate the temperature of their chips? And, and why should uh, a researcher trust uh, this calibration? DEN solutions uses two techniques. Uh, the first is infrared pyrometry. And this allows them to measure temperature gradients over the entire chip. Uh, so you can see that in the image at the right here. 
but they also are using uh, a second technique. Uh, infrared pyrometry is, is difficult to calibrate uh, precisely, uh, but they also use Raman spectroscopy, uh, which allows them to measure the local temperature of a sample on the electron transparent windows. Uh, and this allows them to quantitatively calibrate the infrared pyrometry uh, and to, to calibrate the temperature of the chip based on the temperature of a sample, not based on the temperature of the, the heating element or, or some other location on the chip. So how accurate is this temperature? You can see in the, the previous slide that there are significant gradients across the chip. Um, so, so that uh, brings up the question of, of is the, the temperature uniform? Uh, is the temperature accurate when you're using this holder? And the answer is that the variation in temperature between these windows in the center of the chip, uh, which is where DEN Solutions recommends uh, that you image the sample, uh, the, the variation there is less than 3%. Uh, and then solutions guarantees an accuracy of 5% uh, within those four central windows. And so it's, it's good to, to know uh, that then solutions is doing careful calibrations and, and doing careful measurements of the temperature of their chips. Um, but I think it's even more valuable to, to get independent uh, measurements of the temperature accuracy. And, and also, in, in principle, to be able to do this yourself uh, at the microscope before an experiment. Uh, and so I, the final thing that I want to show today is some independent measurements of temperature accuracy uh, done by several groups around the world and, and published. Uh, in the literature. So here's an example uh, using Raman spectroscopy. Uh, and this example here, I, I want to, to preface by saying that this is a, an older design of a protochips holder. This is not their new uh, technology. And so it's the, the result is a bit outdated, but the technique uh, is what I want to focus on here. The, their, uh, this was done at NIST, and they were able to use Raman spectroscopy inside the microscope to measure the temperature of a sample on these electron transparent windows. Uh, and so this enables them to, to really uh, quantitatively measure the temperature uh, while the holder is inside the microscope. Uh, here's uh, another example uh, from a group in Germany. Uh, and in this case, they used uh, electron diffraction uh, to measure the temperature. And so they do this by uh, measuring subtle shifts in the, uh, in the, the lattice spacing of the material. And uh, because as the, the uh, sample is heated, the, the lattice expands, and they can do very precise measurements of these diffraction rings. They did very uh, careful calibration and also uh, additional um, alignment of uh, the microscope optics uh, in order to, to really do very careful measurements of the lattice spacing as they're heating the sample. And they found uh, that, in fact, the, the temperature that they measured using diffraction matched the, the temperature given by the DEN Solutions holder uh, to within 5% uh, as DEN Solutions claim. Uh, here's the, the final example uh, of measuring the temperature inside the microscope. And, and here we return to eels uh, and to this technique where uh, this uh, group at uh, USC, uh, led by Matt Mecklenburg, is using the, the plasmon peak energy uh, to measure the temperature uh, inside the microscope. And so uh, they, as I showed before, they're, they're measuring this uh, plasmon peak uh, by, by fitting a, a function to, to the data here. And they're able to measure uh, the temperature fairly precisely. And again, they find that the, 
the difference between the temperature that they measure and the nominal temperature given by uh, the den solutions holder is within 5%. So to conclude and, and to summarize, uh, today I, I gave several examples of published data showing uh, how yields can be used for in situ experiments, both to measure the sample as well as to measure uh, the experimental conditions, uh, the in situ stimuli that are applied, uh, and also uh, several examples of continuously acquired yields data, both in, in yields and in FTEM modes. I also talked a bit about how uh, these MEM space heating holders work, specifically the DEN solutions holder, uh, and then finally about how the how accurate the temperature of these holders is and how several different groups from around the world have used uh, a variety of techniques to measure uh, the temperature of these uh, holders and specifically of the sample on these men's based holders inside the microscope. And so with that, I'll conclude and uh, any questions that you have, please submit those through the questions pane. All right, thank you so much, Dan. We actually do have some questions submitted already. All right. Yeah. So um, let me try to, to frame the, the first question because you it, it ties together both the, the EOS data and the, um, the MEMS based heating holder data. So this tech, the techniques you presented will improve as the underlying technology improves. And so the question specifically is about the newly released end solutions heating chips. Um, so they have new chips they've announced that will reduce the bulging and the drift, would improve temperature uniformity. What sort of improvements do you think would flow through to these techniques? Hmm. Yeah, so as as I said uh, earlier when when I was talking about the challenges for doing continuous yields acquisition, uh, drift is a major problem. So anything that reduces the drift uh, will will really make doing these uh, continuous yields acquisitions much easier. Um, and specifically, I I believe that these these new chips will significantly reduce the uh, the bulging or, or the, the change in, in focus uh, of the sample. And so that will, will really uh, make techniques like, for example, the, the diffraction uh, measurement of temperature, that is complicated somewhat by changes in focus. So that technique will become easier and, and maybe more accessible to, to people who want to measure the temperature and, and any eel measurement will, will really be made much easier uh, as the drift is further reduced. Okay, great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so another question, a couple of related specifically to eels as a technique. Um, so you, you, you did address some of these things throughout the um, presentation, but just to, to recap, one of the problems with interpreting um, movement of peak shifts is to make sure that all the spectra in a series are aligned. So how do you make sure that as a peak moves, that it's not simply drift in the spectrometer versus an actual uh, peak shift? Mm, yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, so ideally, what you would like to do is to simultaneously acquire both the zero loss peak and uh, the peak of interest. Uh, and by simultaneously acquiring both of those, you can use the position of the zero loss peak uh, to, to compensate the movement of other peaks. And, and in the, the software, the GMS3 software, it's very easy to do that. It's just a few clicks um, to select the zero loss peak and, and use that to compensate all the spectra in a spectrum image. Um, and the way to, to acquire both the zero loss peak and the, the spectrum of interest is either uh, to use uh, what we call dual eel, which is available on the, the newest spectrometers, uh, but not the K2. Or in the case of the K2, uh, the, the larger size of the sensor itself uh, enables you to collect a, a much larger energy range with the same dispersion. 
Uh, and so this really enables you to uh, to see multiple peaks that are that are quite uh, spaced quite far apart, uh, and use the the first peak to to uh, correct the second one. Okay. So we have several questions about the future. Uh, let's take one as an example: Can we record video of eels and EDS simultaneously? Mm. Um, yes, you you can um, in the uh, uh, in the interface. Let me see if I can if it's easy for me to uh, to get that interface up here. Um, maybe not. <laughs> All right. Anyway, I'll I'll just describe in words that uh, it is very easy in this uh, spectrum image acquisition technique. Um, to select both yields and EDS. Um, and as long as you have both of those detectors uh, connected to the, the GMS software, um, then it, it is just a few clicks to uh, simultaneously acquire both of those signals. And, and also, uh, you know, for example, the if you're doing STEM, uh, Fuels acquisition stem mapping. You can acquire the uh, the uh, stem signal as well, the the high angle signal. Great. So, another question um, about say future expansion of the work relates to interpreting the effect of the electron beam you know, with mm -hmm. with these techniques. So the question is, um, with respect to the effect of the electron beam. And it's three different methods. How do you think that impacts the temperature measurement? Or mm -hmm. is there a way to quantify, or is that something that's work to be done? Hmm. Yeah, I I think it it is difficult to to quantify um, the effect of the electron beam on the temperature. Um, and I I don't know that I've seen any work uh, that really conclusively shows. How the electron beam affects the temperature. There, there have been people who have done simulations and and uh, detailed theoretical work, um, but I'm I'm not sure that anyone has been able to to measure the difference in temperature at the the local the nanometer scale uh, when the electron beam is on versus off. Uh, possibly you could do that using Raman. I guess, because that doesn't use the electron beam, um, but does allow you to measure the somewhat local temperature. Uh, that's, that's not going to give you a resolution of a nanometer, but um, it, it does give you some spatial resolution to determine the effect of the electron beam. So some other questions related to that technique um, refer to the, the accuracy of the error bars on the technique. So could you just recap what what's the accuracy specifically of using plasmons uh, plasmon peak shifts in eels to measure the temperature? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question, uh, and I'm not sure that I know that off the top of my head. This this paper here uh, will give the answer, um, and I I have the uh, the. Uh, in the bottom right hand corner here is is where you can find uh, that paper on archive. Uh, so so that paper discusses that in some detail. All right. Yeah, so please do refer to uh, published data for that. And if you have a more specific question, by all means submit it to us and we can answer and discuss offline as well. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so several other questions. I appreciate the questions, and and please, if you haven't submitted a question yet, uh, we we welcome your feedback. I'd love to know what you'd uh, like us to address, and if we don't get to it here in the time of the webinar, we will follow up with you offline. Um, an another question relates to uh, gases and some of your work before joining the TAN, but also mm -hmm. how that might impact uh, these techniques. So. Will the gas in, interact with the electron beam? And if so, what's the maximum gas pressure before uh, the PEM operation would be negatively affected? And then how would that roll into these techniques as well? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, at, at Stanford, they've been doing some, some very nice work that shows clearly uh, the effect of the electron beam on the gas. The, the electron beam uh, is ionizing uh, the gas in the microscope. Um, and this happens even at, at relatively low pressures of, of a few millibar um, and will likely be even more pronounced uh, as you increase to, to pressures like one atmosphere. Um, and so the, the ionization of the gas by the electron beam um, really can't be avoided entirely. Um, and uh, like, like in the case of liquid cells, uh, they also have similar issues. And uh, I think in the future, uh, we may figure out ways to, to mitigate that effect. Um, but it's certainly something that needs to be considered uh, that when you're using a gas uh, in the TEM, not only do you have th that gas, but you probably have uh, ionized species as well, uh, and possibly even almost like a plasma at, at very high beam currents. So, so as you were talking, we uh, we had uh, a comment uh, provided by. Matt back on Berg, you know, reference his paper. Yeah. So Matt, appreciate you providing some additional comments. So uh, Matt tells us that beam heating is small with good when there's good thermal conductivity, and also if they have an updated paper um, on, on silicon that showed negligible change with the beam. Okay. So we can work with Matt to get that reference and to push that out, maybe update the slides as we publish the results. So we'll, we'll make that update and get that information out there. Yeah, great. So again, thank you, Matt, for, for the comment. Okay, a couple questions just related to the technique and, and the camera equipment. Um, can we record energy filter diffraction patterns directly on the case? Uh, yes, um, you can. Uh, and I, I didn't show any of that data here uh, since uh, this is all about the, the eels capabilities, um, and, and uh, well, I, I guess I did have F10 data. Um, so you can, yes, do energy filtered uh, diffraction on the, the K2. You, you do need to be careful about the, the dose, uh, particularly if you're doing parallel beam, uh, you know, uh, selected area diffraction, um, you have to be uh, aware of the intensity of, of the, the central spot, uh, but it's certainly uh, possible to do even uh, parallel beam electron diffraction if you're careful. Uh, and, and to do that in a, a filtered uh, mode with the K2 at the back of the GIF. Yeah, so regarding uh, the K2 and the GIF, do you notice any uh, image degradation? Any uh, resolution degradation by using the K2 at the end of the kill? Uh, I I don't um, actually have I believe a, a slide here, yeah, showing uh, some images that were acquired with the the K2 at the end of the GIF, um, and this was not an aberration corrected microscope, uh, so uh, I'm I'm not going to be seeing sub angstrom spacings here but I, I believe that's a, a limitation of the microscope not of the camera but we do uh, see very clearly in in this image uh, very fine spacings uh, which you can see here in the, the diffractogram and I was acquiring these at a fairly low dose uh, and so in fact the the k2 really shows much better performance at this uh, low dose rate than the CCD camera, uh, which was uh, connected here at the same time and, and I was imaging the same region here. Uh, and when we go to even lower doses, then uh, the, the, the difference is even more significant. Um, but I think, again, to answer your question, I, I don't see any significant degradation of the, the image quality and the image resolution by having the, the camera at the back of the GIF. Okay. 
And so, so one final question, and then there's uh, many more questions in the queue. And if we don't get to yours, we are sorry, but we will follow up with you offline. And please continue to submit questions. We'll be happy to, to follow up. Um, this question follows on with uh, the previous question, the K2 on the back of the GIF. Right? It's important to be able to operate across a wide range of accelerating voltages. So how, do, how, does the, how, how well does the K2 work at 80 kV? And is this technique applicable to other in situ cameras uh, by Catan? Hmm. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure that I, I know uh, the answer to that uh, about the, the performance of the K2 at different accelerating voltages. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I don't think I can comment on that right now, but uh, I'll, I'll uh, get back to, to whoever asked that question um, once I learn the answer. <laughs> uh, but I'm always using the, the K2 on a, a single microscope and, and always using it as the, the same accelerating voltage, so I'm not sure. But there are options related to other cameras. Uh, yes, yes. Well, that, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have in the webinar today. We still have several questions. I will continue to take your questions and appreciate the feedback. Thank you so much for your attendance today. We look forward to connecting with you again in the future on our next webinar. Yeah, thank you.